When authorities initially searched Robert Picton's pig farm, they were acting on suspicion related to his possession of illegal firearms. However, what they encountered surpassed anything their collective years of experience had prepared them for. The scene they uncovered demanded a new warrant for a deeper investigation. Among the grisly discoveries were scattered body parts and bones, with many found within the pigsties. Shockingly, a significant number of these remains belonged to indigenous women. This case sent shockwaves throughout the entire country, cementing Picton's status as one of Canada's most notorious and dangerous serial killers. This is the gruesome story of Robert Picton and how he would go on to murder 49 women, feed them to his pigs and have only one rather sick regret that he couldn't get to make it around at 50 before he was caught. Delve deeper into this haunting tale if you dare, as the staggering details of this episode are certain to captivate and astonish. On October 26, 1949, Leonard and Louise Picton welcomed their third child, Robert William, also known as Willie, who became the middle sibling in their family. Hailing from a lineage of pig farmers based in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia, located 17 miles east of Vancouver, Canada, the Pictons had established themselves in the agricultural community. Due to the nature of their work, their eldest daughter, Linda Louise, was sent to live with relatives in Vancouver as it was deemed inappropriate to raise a female child on a pig farm. As a result, Robert and his younger brother, David Francis, were raised in a farming environment where they were accustomed to rigorous work routines enforced by their mother, Louise. Working long hours tending to pigs from a young age, the boys were subjected to strict discipline with little concern for personal hygiene. This neglect led to Robert and David being taunted by classmates, earning them the derogatory nickname, Stinky Piggy. Despite the harsh conditions, Robert developed a closer bond with his mother than with his abusive father. At the age of 14 in 1963, Robert dropped out of school and pursued a job as a butcher's apprentice. However, seven years later, he returned to work full-time on the family farm after concluding his apprenticeship. Following the deaths of their parents in 1978 and 1979, Robert and his siblings inherited the farm, but only Robert showed interest in managing it. He took on the responsibility of running the farm single-handedly, residing in a trailer on the remote property, while his brother David inherited the family home. Robert surrounded himself with a questionable circle of friends and employees, all of whom had dubious reputations. In 1994 and 1995, he sold portions of the inherited land, amassing a substantial sum of $5.16 million. Little did the residents of Port Coquitlam know that Picton Farm and House would later be revealed as the dumping ground for decapitated bodies and evidence of Robert Picton's heinous crimes. The Pig Palace Farm earned a reputation for its eerie appearance, while Robert Picton was known locally as a reserved individual though his occasional peculiar actions would attract notice, despite no evidence of substance abuse. The Picton siblings began to neglect their farming responsibilities, instead frequently hosting raves and extravagant parties at a renovated structure on the farm, dubbed the Piggy Palace. In 1996, they established a non-profit charity named the Piggy Palace Good Time Society, aimed at organizing and managing special events, dances, shows, and exhibitions for various service and sports organizations. Neighbors voiced complaints about the rowdy gatherings, citing issues such as drug use, excessive drinking, and noise disturbances. These parties drew crowds of up to 1,700 attendees, including bikers and prostitutes from the downtown east side, a district noted for its high levels of poverty, homelessness, drug addiction, and prostitution. In March of 1997, 
Robert faced charges of attempted murder following an altercation with sex worker Wendy Lynn Eistetter, whom he allegedly stabbed multiple times at the farm after handcuffing her. Eistetter reported disarming Picton and injuring him with his own weapon before escaping. While Picton sought medical treatment at Eagle Ridge Hospital, Eistetter recovered at the nearest emergency room. However, the case against Picton was dropped when Eistetter failed to appear in court, casting doubt on her credibility. Had Picton been convicted, it might have prevented a multitude of subsequent tragedies, as this incident marked only the beginning of his disturbing spree. He was released on a $2,000 bond and the charges were dismissed in January of 1998. However, another setback occurred while following a New Year's Eve celebration in 1998, when the Picton siblings faced a lawsuit for violating zoning regulations, leading to a legal injunction preventing them from hosting any further events. Subsequently, the Piggy Palace Good Time Society was dissolved in January 2000 due to its failure to submit the required financial statements. In 1999, Canadian authorities received a tip alleging that Robert kept human remains in freezers on his property. Although a warrant was obtained, no search was conducted at the time. Concerns grew as it became apparent that several women who had visited the farm had subsequently gone missing. On February 5, 2002, a search warrant was finally executed as part of an investigation into illegal firearms. During the search, the Picton brothers were arrested and a subsequent warrant was issued after authorities discovered personal items belonging to a missing woman on the premises. This search was part of the broader BC missing women investigation, which probed the disappearances of numerous women, many from Vancouver's downtown east side dating back to September 1978. The downtown east side, also known as the Low Track, was notorious for its rampant drug trade and prostitution, as well as having the highest HIV infection rate in North America. The missing woman whose belongings were found at the farm was among those being investigated by the task force. During the search, investigators uncovered disturbing evidence including human remains such as skulls cut in half and stuffed with hands and feet, DNA from 33 individuals, bloody clothing, and items suggestive of violent acts such as revolver with a dildo attached to its barrel. Robert claimed that the dildo was used as a makeshift suppressor with DNA evidence linking both him and a victim to it. On February 22, 2002, Robert was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder in connection with the deaths of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. Additional charges followed in subsequent months, ultimately totaling 15, making it the largest investigation of any serial killer in Canadian history. As investigations continued, excavations at Picton's farm persisted through November 2003 costing an estimated $70 million. In May 2004, the government made a disturbing announcement, suggesting that Picton may have mixed ground human remains with ground pork and potentially sold it to the public. This prompted a health advisory and raised concerns about the possibility of human remains being fed to the pigs, further fueling public horror and revulsion. On January 30, 2006, Robert Picton's trial commenced in New Westminster. As anticipated, he pleaded not guilty to 27 charges of first-degree murder in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. One charge was dismissed by Justice James Williams on March 2 due to insufficient evidence. Five months later, the 26 remaining charges were divided into six groups with the cases of Monty Lee Frey, Georgina Faith Papin, Brenda Wolfe, Andrea Josbury, Serena Abbotsway, and Mona Lee Wilson proceeding first. The other 20 counts were stayed in August 2010. A publication ban restricted public access to court details, 
with the judge citing concerns that a simultaneous trial of 26 counts might burden the jury and jeopardize proceedings. Moreover, each count had distinct evidence. The trial for the initial six counts began on January 2, 2007, coinciding with the lifting of the publication ban. Canadians were finally apprised of the disturbing findings at the Picton Farm, which were presented in court on February 20. Additionally, police discovered a syringe containing blue liquid and Spanish fly aphrodisiac in Robert's trailer. The most incriminating evidence emerged from videotapes, including Robert's friend Scott Chubb discussing injecting windshield washer fluid into a heroin addict. Another tape featured an associate named Andrew Bellward claiming that Robert confessed to killing sex workers by handcuffing, strangling and then dismembering them before feeding their remains to pigs. The discovery of human remains, identified as Mona Wilson's, further implicated Robert. Judgment was delivered on December 9, 2007 with the jury finding Robert not guilty on six counts of first-degree murder, but guilty on six counts of second-degree murder. He received a life sentence without parole eligibility for 25 years, the maximum penalty for second-degree murder in Canada. Justice Williams described Robert's actions as murderous and reprehensible, emphasizing the senselessness and despicability of the victim's fate. Robert's attempts to appeal faced challenges. A criticism was leveled against the RCMP and Vancouver police for their handling of the case, including information withholding and inadequate collaboration. Despite the controversy, Robert's convictions stood and the remaining 20 charges were unlikely to be prosecuted due to the complexity of the case. As the investigation continued, Details of Robert's crimes remained unclear. Witness testimony suggested he lured victims to the farm where he subjected them to violence before killing them. During a hearing in August 2010, it was decided that Robert would be transferred from a provincial pretrial institution to a federal penitentiary. In June 2018, he was reportedly moved from Kent Institution in British Columbia to a penitentiary in Port Cartier, Quebec. While incarcerated, Robert confessed to a total of 49 murders, expressing a desire to reach an even 50. A video recording of the statement was later used as evidence at his trial, where he claimed to find the number 49 odd, so if he isn't convicted, Robert William Picton said, and I quote, I was gonna do one more to make it an even 50. That's why I was sloppy. I wanted one more to make the big 5-0." Unquote. Thank you for tuning in today. If you enjoyed our content, kindly consider subscribing. Feel free to share any intriguing stories in the comments that you'd like us to explore. Join us again next time for another episode featuring chilling and mysterious tales. Who knows? Your town might just be next.